Support for today's episode comes from the Scott Allen Turner Show, the financial rock star. I've known Scott for a number of years. He's a very, very talented podcaster. The aim of his show is to help you get out of debt faster, save more money, and retire rich. Scott calls himself a former money moron turned early retiree, and his podcast is really entertaining, especially his opening. I love his opening. Just search for the Scott Allen Turner Show and subscribe. A-L-A-N is how you spell Allen. Scott Allen Turner Show. Welcome to Money for the Rest of the Personal Finance Show on money, how it works, how to invest it, and how to live without worrying about it. I'm your host, David Stein, and today is episode 147. It's titled, Is Infrastructure a Good Investment? Last month, Laprille and I drove our VW Gold automobile down a dirt road from our hotel in Tulum through the Sean Khan biosphere to arrive at the fishing village of Punta Allen in Quintana Roo, Mexico. The distance was about 30 miles, and it took just over 65 minutes for an average speed of 15 miles an hour. Three years ago, my friend Dick and I attempted the same journey on our fishing trip. This time, we rented a Jeep. In two hours, we had traveled a little over halfway to Punta Allen and stopped at Yamas Dos, where we spent the night. We averaged less than eight miles per hour. Now, both times our speed was hindered by huge potholes in the road. In the earlier journey, some of the potholes were as big as our Jeep. Now, this time with Laprille and I, the road had been recently graded, and so we made better progress, but there were still some sizable potholes. Had the road been paved, the journey would have been so much faster, yet Does it make sense to pave this dirt road that goes through the biosphere? Punta Allen has a population of just under 500 inhabitants. Now, the American Road and Transportation Builders Association estimates it costs roughly $2 million to $3 million per mile to build a road in a rural area of the United States. Now, granted, in Mexico, it would probably be cheaper, but it would still cost hundreds of thousands of pesos per individual at Punta Allen. Should the government pave the road? When you travel through Mexico, there's always signs that says this this work on this road has been sponsored by the state government or the federal government and, and how much money was spent and what improvements were being made. Robert, who is a member of the Money for the Rest of Us Hub, is a listener, wrote me and recalled a time he drove, this was in 2009, he was driving from Charleston, South Carolina to Seattle, and he passed through or near Yellowstone National Park, right near where I live here in Idaho. He says he was on a two-lane road in the middle of nowhere, and there were more bison near the road than people. And he remembers passing a sign that said the construction of the road was funded by the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. And he remembers wondering how, you know, this is the middle of nowhere, why, why are they building and working on a road funded with, with federal money that, that's just very, very far from, from, from anyone? What's the long-term benefit? Does it even have value in the short term in terms of hiring workers? And he says it's not like Yellowstone benefited from any substantial length of time from the temporary influx of contractors. And so we want to we want to look at infrastructure. Does it make sense? You know, what how do we decide or how does the government decide or the private sector decide whether to undertake an infrastructure project? And is infrastructure something in our personal investments we can invest in, and does it make sense? So why pave a road? Think about this road to Punta Allen. What, what would be the benefits of any type of infrastructure project like that? Really, there's two. One, will the particular project increase productivity? In other words, will that investment allow for more goods and services to be produced per worker, which would include the transportation of, of whatever goods and services produced back out into to, to civilization. Punta Allen, there's not, not a whole lot there. there. There's fishing guides. If you like to bone fish, great place to go. And, and I suspect fishing is the primary thing that goes on in the economy. I saw one or a couple stores, a few restaurants, but, but that's it. So paving the road, will it increase productivity? The second reason is is will it increase well-being? 
Well, it helped the people. There are many infrastructure projects that don't have a payback in terms of increased productivity, but helps people feel better. Examples throughout Mexico, you'll also see signs. Who who installed the the water system? Because many, many towns didn't have water, running water at all. And so the government made an investment to to have a, a running water system in the town or a wastewater treatment. These are things that don't necessarily increase productivity, but increases well-being. Here's how the Congressional Budget Office puts it as it relates to highways. They write, spending for highway infrastructure can increase economic productivity and well-being by providing benefits to businesses and households. It can increase the productivity of businesses when it reduces freight delivery costs, shortens travel times, or improves reliability. Spending for highway infrastructure can also provide benefits to households by lowering the cost for employees to commute to work, shortening commuting times, and improving the re- reliability of commutes, improving households' access to health care, education, and other valued services, improving the safety of travel, and reducing some of the harmful byproducts of transportation, such as pollution. Now, how, how are highways infrastructures funded in the U.S.? And the major source is the Highway Trust Fund. It was created by Congress in 1956 to basically expand the the internet highway system. And in 1982, Congress added a mass transit account to finance federal investment in subway and public transportation. Most of the revenue that goes into, or much of the revenue that goes into these trust funds are from use taxes, particularly A gasoline tax of 18.3 cents per gallon. It's a federal excise tax on gasoline and gasohol. And then there's a 24.3 cents per gallon tax on diesel fuel and some additional taxes on compressed natural gas, on heavy trucks and truck tires. So in a recent years, revenues from these, this highway trust fund from this use tax was 38 to 42 billion dollars. But still, that wasn't enough to maintain the highways. The CBO says that from 2008 to 2014, lawmakers have transferred about $143 billion additional money from other sources to help that trust fund, the highway trust fund, maintain a positive balance. Now, what's interesting is, and this gets to Robert's thoughts as he was driving through Wyoming, how is it this road got got selected? Now, if the road was in Yellowstone National Park, I can tell you there was a lot of traffic in the summer in Yellowstone National Park. But there are also roads in rural Wyoming that get repaved, and you, you have to wonder, there's not a town anywhere near. And so the, the CBO says, spending on highways does not correspond very well with how the roads are used and values. Almost all federal spending for highways occurs through formula grants to state and local governments. And historically, less than half of the funding has been tied directly to the amount of travel on the roads. So there's roads being paid for by federal funds and state and and local governments that aren't necessarily the most highly traveled road. In other words, it's not a a change, an infrastructure investment to increase productivity. It's an investment to increase well-being. Now, an example of a road out when we were in Teton Valley, Idaho at our farm, there were two roads to our farm. Both, well, one was was just a completely dirt road, and they would grade it every once in a while, very hilly, just didn't make sense to pave. The other had been a paved road, but had as big as potholes in it as we saw on the way from Tulum to Punta Allen. And and the, the county never had enough money because the citizens didn't value sufficiently raising their taxes to pay for it. And so what did this what did the county do? They basically tore up the road and turned it into gravel. They tore up the concrete because they got tired every every spring fixing these huge potholes and then they would they were torn up again because the, the road needed to be completely rebuilt and there wasn't enough money. Yet the county approved Three or four subdivisions right by my farm that never got built, but th- that was going to have 300 to 400 houses in them, which, which makes no sense that if there's not a good road, why would you want to add more people? Because it's better to have the funding for roads go to where the most use is in, in terms of just 
That just make that just makes logical sense. But as it happens now, that isn't the way it goes about. Here's the CBO again. Even though highway travel is more concentrated on interstates and in urban areas, and urban roads are typically in poorer condition than rural ones, the federal government and state governments typically have spent more per mile of travel for major repairs on rural roads. Moreover, the extent to which new highways boost economic activity has generally declined over time, increasing the importance of maintaining existing capacity. Yet spending has not shifted much accordingly. Sounds like more federal money is going to building new roads as opposed to where you're not getting the productivity boost as opposed to maintaining the road, particularly where the most people drive. The American Society of Civil Engineers estimate 42% of Americans' major urban highways remain congested, costing the economy an estimated $101 billion in wasted time and fuel annually. Now, the the American Society of Civil Engineers, they do a infrastructure report card every four years. The most recent one was in 2013. Next week, early March, I think March 7th, they're going to introduce their new report card. Now, Infrastructure, they they look at all different types of infrastructure. They're looking at water and environment, such as dams, drinking water, hazardous waste, levees, solid waste, wastewater, transportation, such as aviation, bridges, inland waterways, ports, rail, roads and transit, as well as public parks, schools, and energy. And then their most recent 2013 report card, pretty much everybody got a D, every one of those areas. Looks like bridges got a C plus, ports and rails got C and a C plus, parks got a C, but C D the only B no A's no A's in infrastructure on the B in solid waste, and and so they estimate there's a huge gap in terms of what is needed in terms of infrastructure investment, particularly let's say look at highways. They estimate, this is a 2013 report card, there needs to be $1.7 trillion to maintain existing surface transportation. In terms of new investment, it helps solve the congestion. That's by 2020. They estimated only $187.7 billion would be funded, leaving a gap of $850 billion. That's huge. It seems like there's never enough money for infrastructure. I it's been decades and I remember back when I was in college reading articles about how we need our infrastructure is falling apart and we need more investment. Well, why doesn't it happen? Well, here's a provocative answer from Ben Hunt of Salient Partner. I believe he's chief risk officer. He wrote this in his Epsilon Theory newsletter. He writes, "And to be clear, My personal belief is that Larry Summers and the rest of the public infrastructure projects are great investments crowd are sniffing glue. You're pulling forward future economic activity. That's all. I'm not saying that government spending is bad. On the contrary, government spending is absolutely necessary to preserve life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and a certainly a societal return on investment from government spending. That would be the well-being aspect of it. But don't tell me, he goes on, don't tell me that there's this huge productivity enhancing non-quotation mark economic return on investment generated by the government building stuff that the private sector doesn't want to build. Don't tell me that what China is doing with their infrastructure is mal investment, that, but that if we do it, well, that's different because, you know, our infrastructure is crumbling instead of gleaming the way it is in um, China. Yes, LaGuardia is a miserable airport, so stipulated, but there are infinitely greater productivity gains to be had from changing our insane TSA regulations and reducing security lines than by building a new Terminal B. If you want a massive Keynesian deficit spending program on top of our massive current debt, fine, make the argument. There's an argument to be made, but don't be a specious and don't don't put a specious investment wrapper around it. Infrastructure is funded in two ways. Either the government builds it, and we've seen with the highways, they're building it, but often in the wrong places, and the money is diverted in a way that it probably isn't based on use. It's not going to the most badly needed areas. 
or citizens aren't willing to raise their taxes in order to pay for it at the local and state level, or it's because the private sector is unwilling to build it for some reason. Either they're not seeing an economic return to justify the cost, or there's something else prohibiting it. Here's one thing that's prohibiting it. This is from The Economist. Private investors don't fix roads for the sake of smoother asphalt. They do it to get a return on their investment. That means the projects undertaken will be the ones that make money through user fees. In most cases, tolls. This private par- public-private partnership, it's called P3S, depends on being able to generate an income stream from an infrastructure investment. And the reality is... We've lived in a country where most roads are free in in terms of day-to-day. We don't pay tolls. We don't like to pay tolls. There is a public backlash whenever tolls make sense. But there's actually an economic argument for having more tolls than we currently have. And I'll explain that after the break. One of the ongoing requests I've had from money members of the Money for the Rest of Us Hub is give us the ability to listen to my premium audio content plus episodes audio lessons, audio summary of investment conditions, and ad-free versions of the podcast in our normal podcasting apps. Nice that you have your own app, but we'd like to listen to it just in our regular podcasting app. That will be available in a few weeks, and I'm doing that by partnering with GoDaddy because in order to do that, I need an SSL certificate to provide a secure feed. I've gone to GoDaddy. We'll be buying that, and GoDaddy is a partner in terms of my online business and projects and can be yours. There are more than 62 million domain names under management, award-winning 24-7 support, trusted by 13 million customers can help you whatever your online needs. And right now, get a special discount at GoDaddy for on a GoDaddy domain, 30% off. Use the code DAVID30. That's GoDaddy.com, code name DAVID30 and get 30% off. One of the more frustrating things about running your own business is, is waiting to get paid. You send out an invoice and then you, you, wait, you check your bank account. Did you get paid? You go to the post office, check the mail, see if you got paid. Did you get paid? One of the beauties of FreshBooks is the ability to, to take control of that whole situation. You can create and send a clean and professional looking invoice in about 30 seconds. And then there's a notification center. It's like a personal assistant. It will notify you whenever you log into the app, whether you got paid or not, and whether you need to follow up. You can send follow-ups. That's FreshBooks. It also makes keeping track of your expenses ridiculously simple. Makes the accounting very, very simple. You don't even have to know accounting to use FreshBooks. And you can link your bank account to import your expenses and have them automatically categorized. You can try FreshBooks. Get a free 30-day trial by going to freshbooks.com slash David and enter in money for the rest of us in the how did you hear about us section. That is freshbooks.com slash David. One of the benefits of tolls, it puts a cost to using something in, sometimes we'll, we'll go to Orange County, Newport Beach area. There are a number of toll roads. There's one's a fairly short highway, and I do everything I can to avoid it because usually I'm going somewhere within Orange County, and I'd rather not pay the toll. One, I don't have a card to pay it, so it's inconvenience. They don't take cash. But two, I'd rather just take the, the long way, the way with more traffic, because I personally don't want to pay the toll. Toll roads are like that. They put the price on use, and if there is a road or a bridge, or a project where there's enough demand, then a private-to-public partnership can make sense because then there's an identifiable income stream, there's demand, and, and it, will be, it will be built. Now, hopefully you have don't have the political opposition. You, you certainly need to overcome the resistance uh, of the, the public sector or the resistance of, of citizens of having public assets held or controlled by the private, but it can be a very workable model, but it often doesn't happen. And it isn't because of a lack of capital. The McKinsey Global Institute put out a report where they said the world will need to spend almost $57 trillion on new infrastructure over the next 
15 years. That's an enormous sum, but contrary to popular belief, there's no shortage of capital. In fact, there will be more than enough as both governments and investors increase their focus on infrastructure. They say the pool of capital available is deep across infrastructure funds, institutional investors, public treasuries, development banks, commercial banks, corporations, and even retail investors. We estimate that more than $5 trillion a year is available for infrastructure investment. And, and that, that, that's an amazing sum, but it's not being put to use in many cases, either because the projects don't have an identifiable income stream due to political opposition, or they're not productivity enhancing. There's no justification for the project. And an example of that is a lot of high-speed rail projects. High-speed rail, I read an article by Susan Muldowney in it's a, it's a, a magazine called In the Black. It was titled Bullet Trains and the Economics of High-Speed Railways. And all the links I've mentioned in this episode will be in the show notes at moneyfortherestofus.net. Or if you remember my free insider's guide, you can get that sent to you in an email free right after each week's episode is done. You can sign up for that also at moneyfortherestofus.net. Or if you're a U.S.-based listener, just text the word INSIDER to the number 44222. Well, in this article, she mentions how the Shikansen, which I've written on in Japan, fascinating, fascinating journey. It's shot out of the Tokyo station more than 50 years ago, and more than 5.6 billion passengers have safely traveled along that. It, it was able within 10 years to pay back its development costs and, and start essentially making a profit. It serves between Tokyo and Osaka which is about three hours. Now, they want to do a high-speed rail in Los Angeles to San Francisco. It was originally estimated to cost $43 billion. That has grown significantly more than that. And, and this article says the enormous financial risk associated with the cost of, of high-speed rail reduces its appeal to public-to-private partnerships. And, and it gives examples of a, a high-speed rail in Italy, another one in Taiwan, were basically fell apart. It was supposed to be this private-public partnership in, in Taiwan. Depreciation charges, interest burdens, and lower-than-expected demand have led to heavy losses and lawsuits. And she quotes David Hensher, who is the director of University of Cities Institute of Transport and Logistics Studies. And he says, the, it comes down to the government's obligation and commitment to the social value because from a commercial point of view, these things are pretty marginal. And he's talking about high-speed rail. It's the well-being aspect, because oftentimes it doesn't make economic sense. And he talks about much of the return on private investment is likely through patronage and other tax advantage. In other words, how the government has structured tax credits or other 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 means ends up being the economic driver relative instead of the val- the validity of the particular project. David Walker, who is a associate director of KBMG's infrastructure and project group, says the sweet spot for high speed rail is where there's a journey duration of less than three hours and greater than two. You need a major cities a bit over 150 kilometers away from each other so that people want to use high speed rail but not too far apart from the journey time becomes arduous, in which case an airline makes makes way more sense. So a very, very narrow range for high-speed rail, but very, very high risk. Does it make sense from a private to public partnership and often doesn't make economic sense at all because it doesn't increase productivity because one of the beauties of capitalism, if there is a discrete project and there's transparency, and there's public support, and it makes economic sense, it will get funded. But most of the time, it doesn't for for those reasons. Either there's not the transparency, there's there's not the political support, or it just doesn't make economic sense at all. In the case of Ben Hunt, he says, oftentimes there's better ways. Fix TSA in the security lines before you build a new terminal. Now, most private infrastructure investing comes their institutional partnerships, and we we would research this a lot on our old firm. I don't think we we didn't do a whole lot of them; just didn't didn't find them particularly attractive. There there are definitely some risk there, 
But most, there's been a lot of money raised in institutional partnerships investing in infrastructure. And believe me, they're out to make money. So they're going to find deals that there's an economic return. Now, there is one new crowdfunding site called InfraShares, where individuals can participate in specific infrastructure projects. They have nine projects listed on their site, but right now they're not raising funds. There's an example, they're just gauging interest is what they say. So there's a, there's an, there's a project to expand the LA Convention Center. There's some hydroelectric projects, bridges, highways, and light rail. That's an infrastructure. The main way that individuals can invest in infrastructure is through a fund or an ETF, such as the iShares Global Infrastructure ETF. The ticker symbol in the U.S. is IGF, and it has about 75 holdings. Expense ratio is 0.47%, and if you look at some of its top holdings, its top holding is, is Transurban Group, about 5% of asset. It, that particular company manages and develops urban toll roads it networks in Australia and the U.S. Another holding is Atlantia, which is the, the concessionaire on the Italian national highway system. So I guess they're running restaurants. IANA runs airports and related services in Spain. So there are there are companies, infrastructure related companies that would include utilities, companies like Kinder Morgan. You can buy that in an ETF. The right now it's a little expensive. The price to earnings ratio is over 21, 21 times earnings. The the yield on it's about 3%. It's returned six and a half percent annualized over the past five years. That's through 227. 2017 compared to 8.4% for the the global stock market as measured by the MSCI All Country World Index. You can also invest in bond-related investments tied to infrastructure. The American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009 created what's called Build America Bonds. These were taxable municipal bonds that Essentially, there was a tax credit or other type of subsidy, federal subsidy, to the bond issuer or the bond holder to build infrastructure type projects. There's an ETF. It's the Power Shares, Power Shares Build America Bond ETF, BAB, I believe is the ticker symbol. And it's yielding about 3.8%. The challenge with that, its duration is nine years. So a lot of interest rate risk. So probably not a great investment, but it it's... At times, there are fixed income investments tied to to infrastructure investing. So is infrastructure a good investment? Oftentimes not. There's been a lot of capital raised for infrastructure investing, but the projects aren't coming to fruition because they don't increase productivity sufficient enough to generate an economic return. Or there's projects within the public sphere that don't get funded because citizens are unwilling to fund them through increase in taxes. And so it doesn't happen. As a result, we get this report card that says there's a big gap, yet oftentimes it takes a crisis for something to, to get funded. So there are some, some options from a personal investment standpoint you can look at. But one of the things I found most fascinating in researching this was a paper written by sociologist John Urey. And he talked about this concept of locked in. We have this huge transportation and road network in the U.S. and around the world that that started in the late 19th century when they had horseless carriage races between petroleum-powered cars, essentially, steam-powered cars, battery-powered cars, and and petroleum-powered cars won out. And as a result, there is now an entire complex of interlinkages that supports the automobile culture, such as the manufacturers of car parts and accessories, petroleum refining and distribution, road building and maintenance, car sales and repairs, roadside service areas and hotels, retail malls and shopping centers, and suburban housing development. Yuri writes, this system of automobility, which is what he calls it, stems from the path-dependent pattern laid down from the end of the 19th century. Once economies and societies were locked into what I conceptualize as this steel and petroleum car, then huge increasing returns resulted from those producing and selling the car and its associated infrastructure products and services. Social life more generally was irreversibly locked into the mode of mobility that automobilia automobility 
generates and presupposes. This mode of mobility is neither socially necessary nor inevitable, but has seemed impossible to break from. From relatively small causes, an irreversible pattern was laid down, and this ensured the preconditions for automobility's self-expression over the past astonishing century. Surely, if we want to give it a name, the century of the car. The car represents freedom and flexibility, but that has come at a price. The car has allowed for the unbundling of home, work, business, and leisure that were historically more integrated. Yuri writes, Automobility divides workplaces from homes, produces lengthy commutes into and across the city. It splits homes and business districts, undermining local retail outlet to which one might have walked or cycled, eroding town centers, non-car pathways and public spaces. Members of the family are split up since they live in distant places involving complex travel to meet up intermittently. People inhabit congestion jams, temporal uncertainties, and health-threatening city environments as a consequence of being encapsulated in a domestic, cocooned, moving capsule. And I said I like to drive when you read a quote like that. But that's that's fascinating. This, this, this concept of locked in and how this, this transportation road network has expanded and in many ways separated us. And there's a cost. Yes, we have freedom, but that freedom to drive comes at a cost to the pedestrian or to the cyclist or to, to rail, for example, to public transportation via rail. All this development from the car, and to some extent, we're locked in to the car, and the car transportation, because it is a self-reinforcing growing network. Perhaps as other technological changes, that that will eventually change, but that that's to me, that's just a fascinating concept. This this locked in nature of automobility, which it's has gotten a significantly larger amount of funding as opposed to other areas of the economy. So that's this week's episode on infrastructure show notes at moneyfortherestofus.net everything i've shared with you in this episode has been for general education only i've not considered your specific risk profile i've not provided investment advice simply general education on money investing in the economy have a great week